Hey guys, welcome to the 2 Million Minutes podcast, how to make the most of your four years in college. I'm Lucas, and during finals week, my friend Rosen and I picked the brains of Harvard seniors and asked them to reflect on their college experiences, break down how they approach different aspects of college life, and share lessons they learned with future students. This episode, we are talking with Chris Cruz, who is actually a junior graduating early with the class of 2017 through the Advanced Standing Program. Chris talks a little bit about how the Advanced Standing Program works, what to think about for those considering it, and the experience of graduating early. Chris is going to Harvard Law School in two years and discusses strategic planning for applying to law school, as well as the fast track through the Junior Deferral Program. We hope you enjoy the conversation, and here is Chris Cruz. So we're going to get started. Awesome. Chris, thank you for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Uh, we just talked about the fact that you're graduating early. You're a junior. Right. Um, and I was wondering if you could give us, my friend Rosan is here, um, a sense of how, what that's like, how you feel about it. You're graduating in how many weeks? Three weeks? Yeah, just about. Just about three weeks. <laughs> Crazy. Um, what is it like to graduate early? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bittersweet, to be honest. Uh, sweet in the sense that you know, I will be saving about 65k by graduating early, <laughs> <laughs> which was probably one of the main uh, drivers behind my decision. Okay. Uh, especially knowing that I want to go to law school later. Uh, but also uh, a little better in the sense that, you know, I'm going to miss my friends. I'm going to miss a lot of opportunities that I could have enjoyed or explored uh, my fourth year. Um, so it was definitely difficult in that sense to make that decision. But ultimately, I feel pretty good about it. Um, things lined up for me. I, I, got, I got a job. I got a law school offer. So... Um, it, it definitely required a lot more hard work uh, at, a, at a faster rate than perhaps if I had gone on a four-year track. But uh, How many classes did you take in order to graduate? So to be honest, Harvard's uh, advanced standing program is pretty generous. As long as you meet the requirements in terms of AP or IB courses, you can really just take four classes a semester and graduate on time. Um, mm. The other component for me, I think, was being an economics concentrator. I was able to uh, skip Act 10, the freshman economics courses, and just skip into sophomore classes, Act 10, 10A, and Act 10, 10B. Okay, so it was, it was more a case of having fulfilled requirements in the past that you then would not have to repeat at Harvard? Uh, partly. I mean, I do have some friends, too, who switch to being an economics concentrator their junior year, so it's not impossible. Um, but I'm also on the advanced course track, which is one of the economics department's honors track. So in order to do that, I think it was pretty beneficial to uh, skip the freshman classes. And how many, like, how many people do advanced standing? Um, is there a community, or <laughs> is it just? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, and uh, the the numbers are still a mystery to many. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the, uh, the Harvard administration tries to keep those numbers a little under wrap, but from what I gather, it's usually around 10 to 15 people every year. Interesting. Um, more than half the class qualifies to, to graduate. Wow. Early. wow, okay. But, yeah, based on AP credit, since it's not too right. strenuous of a, of a requirement. But uh, really, based on uh, the fact that financial the financial aid system here meets most people's needs, uh, most people will choose to, to take that fourth year and take those opportunities. Mm -hmm. For me and a few others, it didn't fully meet our needs or uh, what so we would hope for. So it was more of a financial decision? Yeah, it was mainly a financial decision, to be honest. Um, I have another really good friend uh, who made his decision based off the same parameters. Um, uh, but yeah, about 10 to 15 every year is about okay. wow. So given that about half uh, of the students here qualify to do advanced standing, yeah. what are things to think about if you're at least contemplating the idea of, of doing that? Yeah, I, uh, well, I think really if, aside from finances, if you, can, you know, if you can handle that, then you should look at why do I want to graduate early? It shouldn't just be because you want to get your degree a little faster than your peers or you want to you know, start working at X company. Uh, you really got to weigh the cost benefit of it and uh, see, you know, will I value getting that work experience earlier or applying to grad school earlier uh, as opposed to spending a year at the college, another year at the college and, and gaining, you know, or continuing friendships and gaining new opportunities. 
Um, but for me, what I did is as soon as I, <laughs> as soon as I got my first financial aid statement of a whopping zero dollars, uh, I decided to make a, a Excel sheet with a three year plan. And I pretty much laid mm. out all my courses and mm. said, okay, if mm. I'm going to graduate in three years, here's the path I'm going to have to take. And aside from a few courses that I got switched around, I'm more or less stuck to that track. Um, and uh, I really maximized what I could out of uh, Harvard's uh, program. So I'll be graduating with uh, a degree in economics, hopefully with honors. I'll get the results in a little bit, uh, in a few week, a week or two. Uh, a government secondary and a language citation in Spanish. Wow. So and all of that in three years. In three years, yeah. <laughs> so, so when you made that Excel spreadsheet, what were some of the things you looked at to determine what you would have to take? Yeah. Uh, well, definitely trying to bust out uh, all the requirements uh, and some of the easier requirements as fast as I could. Um, and also looking to see what classes overlapped. There's a lot of uh, classes that can uh, quote-unquote double count. Mm -hmm. So you can find a nice economics class that also counts for societies in the world or uh, a different gen ed requirement. Um, so I think I during my time at Harvard I only took one class that was only a gen ed, I think. Um, the rest were all like within a departmental unit. So <coughs> in that sense, uh, just trying to maximize as much of the courses that I could. Yeah. Um, so, do you th do you did you <coughs> apply like the same strategic type of planning to other areas of your life? It seems like <laughs> you at least put thought into what you wanted to do in the limited time that you had here at Harvard. Yeah. Um, and do you have like any advice for other areas of, of student life, college life, for? you know, freshmen or sophomores looking to make the most of the little time. Just all, just all students. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, to, to answer your question about applying that sort of strategy or methodology to other areas, there's, there's I guess, two areas that came uh, right away to my mind. The first is extracurriculars. Um, for me, knowing that I, that I was going to graduate in three years, I, I really had to think about, okay, where do I want to be in three years? Do I want to be... Uh, on the board of X Club, or do I want to be uh, very involved in, in Y organization? And so, <coughs> excuse me. So planning that out, uh, I kind of had to set a timeline, and I was running for positions a little earlier than I thought I would. And you know, sometimes it, it didn't work out. Sometimes there's there's positions that I tried for and I didn't get. But there are others which I pushed myself for, uh, and uh, and ended up getting those positions. And um, I'm happy with the way I, I push myself, even if I didn't get everything I wanted. Um, because, I, you know, you have to make the most of your opportunities while you're here. Uh, the second area that came to my mind was... <coughs> um, the second area that came to my mind was preparing for law school. Um, so for me, uh, I was on a very fast track in the sense that the summer after my freshman year, uh, I, I took an LSAT prep course, and then that sophomore oh. fall, I had I'd taken the LSAT already. Um, Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, if if you if you're a freshman listening to this, don't don't worry too much about uh, studying early for the LSAT. Take it when you feel comfortable and when you feel ready. Um, it was just a very ambitious track that I set for myself. It worked out. Right? So you're on your way to to go to law school. Yeah. Um, are you going to work in between or? Uh, yeah. What are your plans I, yeah. for after graduation? So I got accepted uh, a bit early to Harvard Law School through their junior deferral program, mm -hmm. which for those of you who don't know, it's basically a program in which you apply your junior spring and under the condition that if you're accepted, you'll work for two years prior to beginning law school. Um, so I got accepted through that, and I'll be spending two years uh, in management consulting uh, before heading off to law school as the class, Harvard Law School, as part of the class of uh, 2022. Wow. And is this... Uh, junior program <coughs> binding in, in uh, the sense that you, you'd have to go to law school then? If, if you, you apply done. and you get in, you they let you know over the summer, and then you have until like August 30th, 31st, something like that, uh, to uh, commit to Harvard Law School. Mm. Um, but there's no initial commitment going into it. And once you do commit, the only commitment you're making is the commitment that you won't apply to other law schools, and if you go to law school, you will go to Harvard Law School. Uh, mm. But technically, there's nothing holding you to saying that in two you're years you have anymore. to commit. Right. Mm. Yeah. So you, you've committed, though? I have committed, yes. Okay. So 
that process, can you tell us a little about what went into it? About yeah. Approximately how long it took and what the hardest and easiest <coughs> process were oh, yeah. for students interested in perhaps the law process. Yeah, so surprisingly, I think I found the, the law school admissions process to be slightly easier than the college admissions process. Okay. In the sense that there's no common app, it's just you submit your resume, a few essays, and your LSAT score and grades, and that's more or less, uh, and recommendations, and that's more or less all that you need. Um, the hardest part of it, uh, I think just for me, because I was on an accelerated track, was trying to get the LSAT done pretty early, mm -hmm. and then also making sure I had uh, some very uh, strong connections with professors for letters of recommendation uh, at an early age. Um, but overall, it wasn't too bad. Um, like with all things in life, start early. Uh, don't do your application the night before. Uh, I had some friends do that. I, I, it did work for some of them, not all of them. But <laughs> in general, you should probably start the application fairly early. Um, so talking about professors and relationships with professors, I think for a lot of students, it's always hard to really devote time to maintaining or establishing a relationship with a professor because there are so many things you could do yeah. and students often forget about that aspect of college life. So how did you, um, what, what are some tips uh, that you think are useful for people who really think that this is important but that they just don't find the time to really work on this part? Yeah. Um Geez, there are so many things. Uh, I think, first off, you should really aim to visit your professor during office hours before before midterm season hits. You should make sure that you have, at, le at least that they know your face. And it's surprising, too, because even professors who you talk to after class, they could, uh, they could easily... There's just so many people that come after class to talk to them that they sometimes don't remember every single face. And so I've had that where I feel like I know a professor, I go to the office hours, and then they still ask me some of the same kind of introductory questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where are you from? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm still from L.A. Yeah, <laughs> nothing changed there. Uh, but it's, it's good to develop those personal connections. Um, invite them to faculty dinners. Uh, if classroom or table still exist, uh, then take them to that. Um, just connect with them early. Uh, make sure they know who you are, not just that you know who they are. Um, and I think uh, that helps uh, not only in terms of, of, of uh, developing a connection, but I think also genuinely if you're reaching out to professors, you can also do better in their courses. So. Sweet. Mm -hmm. um, so talking a little bit more about the academic side of college, Yeah. Um, are there any... <coughs> tips or practices that you had for studying for the past three years that you'd like to share with younger students? Um, I think I think setting your priority straight is always is always important. Um, I so I maybe I'm, uh, I'm I, I consider myself type A but at the same time I go a little bit against uh, against the crowd in the sense that I don't really keep like a, a GCAL or a plan or anything like that. <laughs> Um, but what I did do is, is every night and every morning, I would, I would look into what I have to do for the day, mm -hmm. set my priorities, and even if I like had planned to go do something fun or social, or go to some club's event or whatnot, I said, okay, well, I have a, I have a paper due in a week from now, and I have to start that today, otherwise it's not going to get done mm -hmm. on time. So, mainly s Setting your priorities early, but also making sure to loop back around and continuously check on your priorities. Are you on track to finish what you need to finish? Are you uh, have you invested enough time already, or are you going to have to uh, really make a push towards the end? And what sort of tools did you use to keep checking those priorities? Uh, <laughs> I guess I just had a lot of self discipline. Uh, like I said, I didn't really keep a, a planner or a GCAL or anything like that. Um, but uh, I. Uh, so just like remembering things, like kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of um, I don't know. I think also talking to friends in your classes about what you're doing keeps you accountable. Um, you know, asking how far they are on certain things, whether they're struggling with the same concepts mm -hmm. you are, and if you're struggling a little bit more, then maybe that's a sign that you should be going to office hours or should be you know devoting a little bit more time to the readings or the B sets or whatever it may be. It seems very helpful to 
have a plan of what you want to do and where you want to go in order to keep yourself in check. It, it does, it does. Um, yeah, it's funny because I consider myself to be a very long-term planner. Like I said, I planned out my three years at Harvard on an Excel sheet. And yet day-to-day I kind of left myself a little more open. But I think that was kind of on purpose because I didn't want to mm. limit myself here at Harvard. I didn't want to say, okay, I'm going to do X, Y, Z every day, and that's that's who I'm going to be at Harvard. I wanted to, do, you know, take each day as it came and sort of explore the different opportunities that were available. And obviously, work came first, and I prioritized that. But as much as I could fit other fun things into it, I tried to. So, what outside of academics? <laughs> what other fun things <laughs> did you do if you had time? Yeah. Um, well, I was I was just talking to a professor yesterday, hence, you know, you can never stop talking to your professors, right? But uh, one thing I told him that I loved about Harvard was uh, you can just literally walk around campus and find a million things going on. Um, one of my favorite things was always going to uh, the IOP JFK Junior Forums and hearing a prime minister speak or a president or a congressman or anything like that. Um, but also just hanging out with friends. I mean, I had a great set of blockmates. Um, I usually sk- schedule one or two basketball games with them every week. Uh, and uh, also just being super involved in clubs. Um, don't just go to their meetings. If they have social events, go to them. Um, Harvard isn't just about, you know, uh, putting going to as many organizations and, and letting them uh, have their name on your resume. It's about building connections with people and actually getting to know them and who they are. Uh, because more importantly than, you know, one meeting where you talk about planning for X event, uh, you're going to hopefully keep connections with people uh, past that day and into the far future. Hmm. Um, what is one thing that you'd wish you'd known about Harvard before coming? <coughs> Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I th- oh, so I guess one thing I wish I would have known is that it's not so much that there are people who succeed and people who don't succeed at Harvard, but rather there are periods in every Harvard student's life here in which they don't meet as much success as they wish. And I think that there is a stigma at Harvard to saying that I'm not doing as well as I want to do, that I'm struggling, but at one point or another, every Harvard student seems to go through that. Um, For me, it was my freshman fall. Um, I did not do as well as I wanted by, by any measure. Um, and really I had to reflect after that semester and think to myself, okay, am I still on track to be applying to a great law school or to, you know, hopefully getting a job after college? Um, and it took a lot to, to really dig down deep and say, okay, I got to work a little harder. I got to look, uh, to, to be a better student and to, to still maintain my, my relationships. Um, but the thing that also (coughs) was very... (coughs) <clears throat> the other thing that was also very apparent to me as I went through that reflection period was that I wasn't as engaged in service as I had been in high school. And for me, that was a huge motivating factor in everything I did. So it, when I came back to campus in the spring, that's when I joined the Small Claims Advisory Service, which is arguably the organization I've devoted the vast majority of my time to here at Harvard. Um, and being able to help uh, clients with real legal issues and being able to get back to the greater uh, Boston and Massachusetts community, that inspired me and motivated me every day to continue forward, even with the struggles that I sometimes had in the classroom or outside of the classroom. I knew that I was having an impact on this world and that I had to keep fighting, not just for myself, but for others, so that I could leave this institution and hopefully contribute in an even larger way. And so I think at the end of the day, you really have to find what motivates you. You have to keep fighting for what you believe in, and never lose sight of that, no matter how hard any one particular day can be at Harvard. Okay, there's a there's a lot of things going on here at Harvard, so it can be quite hard yeah. to really do what you <coughs> wanted to do, or do what you set out to do before coming here. And that's not to say that um, you shouldn't change, but there's yeah. a lot of distraction and fear <laughs> of missing out. Um, yeah, so FOMO. that's very, very valuable. <laughs> the, the pressure vortex. Right. Ooh, sucks you in. <laughs> I like that too. Sort of in that same vein, um, as a law school applicant, yeah, you're involved in the pre-professional world at Harvard. To a degree. Yeah. Did you? Did you? What do you feel that culture's like? It might be different for 
you know, someone who's interested in law school versus someone who's interested in consulting, but what do you think that the professional atmosphere here is like? Yeah, I think, well, I think, yeah, I think like you said, the pre-professional atmosphere depends on what you want to do. Um, obviously, if you're applying to med school, there are, you know, like eight or whatever different requirements that you had to meet before applying. For law school, there's no one set path, um, and Harvard specifically doesn't have a pre-law concentration, so I guess that eases the burden of uh, trying to force your way th to law school through that. <clears throat> um, but... You know, there are there are a number of different legal organizations here. Um, they all will say that uh, they help you in some way. And I, I'm sure they, they do. But I don't think you should feel compelled to join an organization simply because you think that it will help you get into a, a law school or any other grad school for that reason. Um, like I said, I, I do work with the Small Claims Advisor Service, which is a, a non-profit legal-based organization. But that was more because I was looking for a way to contribute back, not because I thought it would help with law school. I mean, that, that was an added bonus probably, but um, you should do what you want to do, what you enjoy, and what motivates you. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what if you do what you love, then you're more likely to succeed. And the activities you succeed in are the activities that are going to show and really glow on your resume when you apply to certain things. So d did you feel like that way of looking at things was supported by the campus or did you feel like that sort of ran counter to oh. what was ex what was sort of expected of you right. not not expected but what you felt like you should be doing yeah uh, so it's interesting you said is it supported by the campus i think from or the, camp or the, yeah, yeah, no, the no, culture no. on campus yeah, no, no. yeah so like from the administrator's standpoint they'll tell you you know do what you want to do right but from, I guess, the student perspective, depending on who you engage with, there could be more or less pressure to sort of, you know, silo yourself into one specific category and only focus on pre-professional groups or um, groups that, you know, have some sort of reputation that would look good on a resume. Um, and, I mean, I think to a degree, freshman year, like, I tried a, a few groups that kind of appealed in that way, but... I just couldn't find the motivation to stay in those clubs and organizations, and ultimately, I had to go back to what I believed in, what I, where I found my sense of community, and I found that to be much more uh, beneficial and supportive of my success than than going just the standard route. Okay. Um, what is one piece <coughs> of advice that you'd give to rising sophomores slash freshmen, yeah, specifically, <coughs> about uh, what to expect or what to take a look at I would say I would say never forget who you are and why you came here um, I think there's so much tendency to be pressured into doing things that you may not want to do or that you feel compelled to do um, you know before coming here I'm sure a lot of people can't name like all the big consulting or investment banking firms or whatever and yet, at some certain stage in your freshman or sophomore year, you're like, <laughs> I gotta apply to those jobs, otherwise I'm not a successful Harvard student, right? But that's that's just not true. Um, you gotta do what makes you happy. You gotta find what motivates you, and uh, you, you just gotta enjoy the experience. I mean, Harvard's just a really unique place. Um, not everyone gets to go here, and the fact that you're here is, is in my opinion, uh, truly a blessing. So, take every opportunity you can, maximize your time. Um, I mean, we're already good at not getting too much sleep, but you can always <laughs> spare another hour, right? So <laughs> go to that extra event, uh, pour your heart out into your papers, and uh, make sure that you develop those really great friendships. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Rosa, any final questions? Um, no, I just, I thought this was very enlightening, especially the last part, just staying true to who you are and being aware of your motivations is very powerful. And... Um, having a perspective from someone who's leaving this place um, is where it puts things into, into perspective. Yeah. <laughs> um, just expanding a little bit more on that, yeah. um, do you think there were any specific, uh, not necessarily programs or sort of instances that helped you uh, get a better sense of quote unquote who you are or what, what sort oh. of helped you develop that idea? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so like I, I mean, yeah. I, so I guess you're asking like more like uh, 
what instances or situations helped me discover who I was and like, sure, you know, what motivated or a little bit of an abstract question. Yeah, no, I, I feel sure. that. Um, if I if I don't answer this the right way, you, you let me know if you're going towards something else. Don't worry but about it. I think uh, so. Like I said, a lot of what motivated me is is service in many ways. Um, but there service, okay. there were there were so many different instances where um, I had moments uh, through the small kinds of advisory service where I encountered individuals that reminded me a lot of my my own personal situations uh, before coming to Harvard and uh, my own family situation. And remember, or I guess they helped me, they helped me to remember the, the struggles that I overcame, um, uh, that my family overcame. I, I didn't always grow up, uh, I guess, uh, comfortably in the middle class. I, I would say my family is now, but um, to reflect back on where I came from and where I am now and to see them struggle and, to remember that that's why I came here because I wanted to learn the knowledge necessary to, to help others. That that was really powerful. There's there's one instance I remember where a uh, Hispanic man uh, had called us and asked to come in for an appointment, and we didn't know it, but he came in with his wife who was pregnant and also his his, his little son who was probably like three years old. And I could almost imagine my own family who's Hispanic, uh, you know, trying to uh, get some help in some ways when when I was younger and. Seeing them, uh, you know, almost made me want to tear up a little bit. But um, knowing that they, they were, they were looking for help, and that I could now in my life actually give help to people, that that really was a moment for me where I said, "Wow, Harvard has given me this opportunity, and once I graduate from this university, I want to continue to seize these opportunities to help others." and there were just so many instances like that where I found motivation and, you know, obviously like after that meeting with that, with that man, I had to go run and do a piece of or a paper or something like that. But just for that one hour I spent with them, it was, it was really enlightening in the sense that I found or maybe refound who I was and what I was meant to do. Wow. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Lucas. <laughs> really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Chris. Um, what are you most looking forward to for commencement? Are you participating oh, yeah. in the... Uh, yeah, I am. Okay. I'm, I'm walking early, I guess. There you go. Um, maybe I'll sneak into senior week next year. But no, this is going to be my senior week in commencement. Um, I think it's just going to be great to, to have my parents and, and grandparents around. Um, a few of them have not ever seen Harvard. So um, to know their stories of how they work so hard as immigrants in this country... Um, and really from literally nothing but the clothes on their back to seeing their son and grandson graduate from Harvard, I think is, uh, might bring tears to their eyes, but also tears to my eyes. So wow. All right. that is Chris Cruz, thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for joining us.